Several arguments have been put forward explaining Paul's silence, most of which boil down to the argument from context. This argument involves the concept of a low context and a high context society. Context refers to the amount of information that is assumed when we write and speak to each other. In our modern society we are low context because we have a vast amount of information readily accessible on the internet or in libraries and when we communicate with people we cite things, we refer to things and we fill in background because we don't expect the people we are communicating with to hold all this knowledge in their heads. However in the ancient world things would have been very different. The vast majority of people were illiterate and didn't have access to these forms of stored information. Most information they had access to was carried around in their heads. This means that when communicating with each other, much of the background information would be assumed. This is referred to as a high-context society, and in a high-context society one would expect much less in the way of background information to be imparted in things like the epistles of Paul. This argument does have some merit and could explain why under historicity Paul says little about the life and works of Jesus. But is it sufficient to explain the complete lack of commentary in Paul about the life and works of Jesus? And furthermore, Paul specifically says he did not get his message from any man. He says here in Galatians 1 verse 11 and 12, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 4, he adds the other source of his gospel. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul's reference here to the Scriptures is part of another problem with the argument from context, and that is that Paul makes numerous references to the Scriptures. He uses the term Scripture twelve times and makes several other quotations. If context was true of the life of Jesus, why is it not true of the Scriptures? Another way of testing the argument from context would be to examine the non-Pauline epistles, looking for the same references to a historical Jesus using the same kind of criteria we did when examining Paul's texts, and see how many references we find. If the argument from context does indeed explain why Paul mentions historicity so little, then we would expect to make the same findings in the rest of the epistles. If, however, the reason for Paul's silence is that Paul and his very early Christian church did not believe in a historical Jesus, we would expect to see rather more references to historicity emerge as the historicised process progressed in the later epistles. These are the non-Pauline epistles. There are 14 of them, though in the case of Colossians and 2 Thessalonians there is a reasonable body of scholarship that believes Paul did write them. So if we go through them, in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 9, what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? In Colossians chapter 1 verse 22, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. There are four references in 1 Timothy. Chapter 1 verse 15, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Chapter 2 verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Jesus Christ. Chapter 3 verse 16, beyond all question the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. Chapter 6 verse 13, in the sight of God who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you. This last one is the most specific reference to a historical Jesus in the entire New Testament outside of the Gospels, as it connects him with a known historical figure, the only time that occurs in the epistles. In Hebrews we find five potential references. Chapter 1 verse 6, and again when God brings his firstborn into the world he says, Chapter 5 verse 7, during the days of Jesus' life on earth he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Chapter 7 verse 14, for it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and in regard to that tribe Moses said nothing about priests. Chapter 10 verse 5, Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. And chapter 12 verse 26, At that time his voice shook the earth, but now, as he promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Which would suggest that at one time his voice shook only the earth, and that he was therefore on the earth. First Peter is a short book with three references. Chapter 2 verse 21, to this you are called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example, that you should follow in his steps. 
Chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. There is also one reference in Second Peter. Chapter 1, verse 16, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Then in 1 John, chapter 4, verse 2, This is how you can recognise the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Then in 2 John, chapter 1, verse 7, I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world, any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Now this text is interesting for more reasons than its relevance to the argument from context. It shows us that there was a group around at the time when 2 John was written who believed that Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh, in other words that he did not exist historically. This may not have been the only group relevant to the early church and so it doesn't prove that there was no historical Jesus, but it does show that there was an early group within the broad reach of Christianity who claimed this. So comparing the frequencies of these references, we find four references in the 24,093 words of Paul's epistle, or approximately one every 6,000 words. In the non-Pauline epistles, we find 17 references in 20,859 words, or approximately one per 1,200 words. This difference in frequency is statistically significant for what that's worth, and this would seem to argue against the silence of Paul being wholly due to context, though overall I think you'll agree that the non-Pauline epistles are also surprisingly silent on the historicity of Jesus. Another argument put forward by historicists to explain the silence of Paul is that he knew very little about Jesus' life and teachings. He tells us that he spent 15 days in Jerusalem with Cephas, or Peter, early in his ministry, but if Jesus did exist, then most or even all of his sayings and actions could still have been later additions so unknown to Peter. Furthermore, there was a significant schism in the church between Paul's religion, which was open to Gentiles without requiring that they converted to Judaism, and Peter's, which was strictly a branch of Judaism and required that converts became Jews, were circumcised and obeyed the Jewish law. Because of this, Paul may have been inclined to reject reports from the heretical Peter in favour of personal revelations directly from Jesus Christ. This argument shows a weakness in the mythicist position, which holds that on the one hand the silence of Paul suggests that Jesus was a myth, and on the other hand that all the things we would expect Paul to say about Jesus were invented after Paul's death. Nevertheless, if you read Paul's epistles and note his views on mind, what we would call consciousness, body, what we would call the physical body, and spirit, the human attributes Paul saw as being part of the spirit realm, then it's not hard to see where the Christ myth theory comes from. Paul clearly has Jesus as a timeless person in the spirit realm and in the mind, which are his main topics. The complication that Jesus' spiritual existence was interrupted for him to be physically born and die and then return to the spirit realm does not come across at all clearly. So the silence of Paul is an example of quite a common phenomenon. We have two positions, mythicism and historicity. A primary argument is put forward in favour of one of these positions, in this case the silence of Paul in favour of mythicism. Counter-arguments are then put forward by historicists, in this case the argument from context, etc. We then examine these two arguments to find out what they predict in the data. We then go to the data and compare the predictions and the result we find favours the primary argument, but only marginally. That might be fair for the silence of Paul, but I'll turn in the next video to the onomastic argument and see that the historicists aren't finished yet.